Hello and welcome to the program. I am Deji Badimasi. President Mohamedou Buhari is talking tough on insecurity. In the wake of the rising attacks and banditry in the north, the president, in a meeting with heads of the nation's security agency, said he will no longer tolerate excuses while innocent Nigerians have been killed almost on a daily basis. The national security advisor and the service chief had earlier paid a visit to Katsina State where residents have been living in fear due to incessant attacks by bandits in recent weeks. Now, the service chiefs have been warned to double their efforts as the president says their efforts to secure the nation has not been good enough. All right, now let's take a lesson to what the national security advisor had to say after that meeting over what the president actually told uh, the security chiefs. Today's meeting basically focused on recent developments. Mr. President has expressed great concern over the declining security situation in the country. He is extremely unhappy about what is happening and he feels that even though the security agencies are doing their best, their best is not good enough for him, and he wants an immediate reversal of the current trend, an immediate reversal of our misfortunes in all their dimensions. Mr. President also told us clearly, in no uncertain terms, that he and indeed the administration came to power on the platform of three issues. Fighting insecurity, overcoming our economic difficulties, and dealing with the scourge of corruption. And he also noted that it takes common sense for anyone to understand that without security, the other two, the pursuit of the other two objectives will just be an exercise in futility. And therefore, he wants the security agencies to take into consideration the wider implication of the gradual descent of the security of this country. He is not going to accept any further escalation of the security situation. It's also stated that no one was forced on him. He selected everyone individually based on what he feels their records have revealed. And therefore, it is up to each individual organization to live up to the expectation. <laughs> Now, that is, of course, uh, what the president told uh, the security chiefs at the meeting. Now, one other thing that was put before the national security advisor is the issue of when the president is likely to replace the service chiefs. I mean, since the president came out clearly to say, well, that the efforts of the service chief uh, has actually not been good enough. Let's take a listen to how the national security advisor responded. These are issues that only the president can address, not me. I'm just an advisor, and it is up to Mr. President. He has the prerogative to make any change at whatever time he deems fit. Remember, he's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and he is the one who ultimately will take this type of executive decision. Well, that's the National Security Advisor, retired General Mongunu there. And, of course, for the very first time, this is actually the very first time we'd hear the president sound very tough towards uh, the security chief. I'm now being joined on the program by Dr. Onai Komu, who is a security consultant and, of course, a security expert. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us on the program. First off, what's your reaction to all of this? Because for the first time since he appointed them... Uh, to their various positions, the president is coming down hard on the security chiefs. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Digi, for having me. The, um, it's a question of performance. Uh, like we said, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If, for example, uh, they are not uh, living up to the billing of their office, for whatever reason, there are too many attacks, there are too many killings, uh, particularly the uh, killing fields we have in the Northwest, uh, those trees that are around the Rubu Forest, uh, Kebi, Katsina, uh, Zamfara, Kaduna, um, and, uh, Niger, and what have you, uh, the killings are just too many there. And uh, it's really too many to bear. So it's not about um, optics this time. It's about performance. So I have said in the past that uh, there is a need to have a measure, some kind of metrics of uh, how well these chiefs are performing. And on the basis of that, judge their performance uh, in office. And one, one index of performance is how many people we are losing. Because the Constitution guarantees Nigerians that um, the good state, the government, will provide their security and their welfare. So if the security and welfare, uh, uh, if particularly, let's leave, let welfare, if the security is not being provided and the uh, headsmen are coming from Mali and from wherever else to kill Nigerians, then that's not uh, acceptable uh, by any stretch of imagination. So I, I think um, it is good that the president is sounding tough to them and uh, you know, and telling them that, look, I want these things to happen. For example, in 2018 May, the president said uh, they should wipe out all uh, bandits from the Northeast. 2019, he went back to um, May again, went back to Castina State and repeated the statement. Now, this year, again, we've seen all kinds of atrocities that are being committed by uh, the bandits or terrorists. That's what I call them. They're not bandits, really. Mm. Uh, bandits commit crimes. They are uh, gangs that come together to commit crime. But these guys are terrorists. They, they commit uh, uh, hyenas. They commit um, meta crimes. Uh, they burn down villages. They uh, take over farmland from people. They uh, you know, kill people uh, in their dozens and so on and so forth. Uh, it reminds me of um, what Joseph Stalin said. He said, if you kill one person, it's murder. But if you kill uh, a thousand, uh, then it is, uh, you know, it's something different. So that, that's what it is. Now, now, now let, let me interject this. Do, do you think the president is beginning to sound tough now? Because even his home state is now feeling the heat. The people of that state have been protesting against him. They've, 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 they've actually been critical of his government uh, for not being able to protect them. Um, uh, Mr. Deji, clearly so. Uh, I think, um, you know, when it's when you say that there is a militancy in a those states, for example, or State. It's still a little bit far away. But when in the president's hometown, uh, look at Faskari, local government that was attacked the other day, 57 killed. I mean, you, when you're looking at uh, the president's hometown, uh, the home state, and uh, you have these issues, uh, the uh, governor Masari just canceled uh, his uh, peace deal with the terrorists because he said they weren't keeping their end of the deal. So I, I issued a release last week. I said, what, what did he expect? They are criminals. They, are, they have, don't have integrity. So how can you expect them to keep part of the deal? They, you know, they are like sharks. They just look for anything to feed on. And if you happen to be in their way, you become lunch. So, but anyhow, um, I think, uh, yes, you are right, uh, Mr. Deji, because um, with this happening in his state and with the uh, uh, protests and uh, with the youth pouring out in the streets, uh, you know, when a, pro when a uh, prophet starts getting reprimand from his home. He has to pay attention, and that's what we're seeing. Now, but do you think, I mean, from your own position, from, you know, you sit down in a vantage position, you're taking a look at this whole situation, from, from your own position and from your own assessment, do you think the Nigerian military is being overwhelmed by 
this violence we see in the Northeast and, of course, the, the, the Northwest by banditry and uh, the Boko Haram insurgency? Um, I think the way to say it is that the military is overstretched. Uh, when you're overstretched, then you cannot be effective because uh, part of military strategy is to mass resources, to concentrate resources, to solve a problem, and then move out. But when you're overstressed, when you are uh, when you're overstressed, you are doing policing in the Northeast, doing policing in 35 states of the country, um, and uh, providing you know all kinds of uh, services that is not even on the schedule of military. Look at the the guys who went to kill those uh, EFCC, uh, not EFCC, the IRT, the IGP's intelligence response squad detectives. They were they were serving as private guards to Wadume, and uh, so when you get into when you have a military that is spread so thin, and uh, there is lax discipline, and they are doing all kinds of uh, crazy things, then you have these kinds of outcomes that we are having. So I think the military is overstretched. I wouldn't say overwhelmed. Uh, they are not overwhelmed because if they if you know this is uh, irregular warfare. This is. Uh, uh, hit and run, guerrilla tactics. Asymmetric. asymmetric warfare. Thank you, sir. And asymmetric warfare means really you use anything that works, even if it includes setting yourself on fire. If that will work, if that will embarrass the government, then you do it. So this is the problem here. They hit and run, and uh, but now we know where they are. They're in Rugu Forest there. We know that they're in Rugu Forest. So the point is, why can't we go and dominate Rugu Forest? It's like we knew so, for a so, long time. And, and why the, can't we do it? I mean, why are we unable to do it? And then, because if, if you also say that the military is overstressed, so we, we can then say that maybe the service chiefs are not to blame. Maybe the president is actually to blame because it's his job to recruit more soldiers. I have said so on several occasions. When I'm asked, should the service chiefs go, I said, well, somebody hired them to do a job, and they are there doing the job. So I said, until that person makes a decision, makes a call that those people are no longer doing the job, they, I mean, I have no business telling the president that they should go. So you are right. I think it's a political imperative. It's a political decision. Uh, the fact that this, we know this threat is well-studied, we know how it is occasionally, how it's coming in, how it's amplifying. And if there is no political will to tackle it, and I've heard that word bandied around so many times, mm. then of course it's not going to be tackled. So mm. I, I think it's very unfortunate that uh, we are still here having this narr narrative. And what I see, I see another Boko Haram occurring in the Northwest, because this is the same way we use kid gloves to handle Boko Haram in the Northeast, and it's here with us 11 years after. So I, I don't know, I mean, it looks like sometimes we are cutting crisis. We just want them to come. Instead of moving in there uh, clinically, uh, dealing with the crisis, and then letting people go on with their lives. But these are Nigerians who are being killed. That's my problem. These are my countrymen who are being slaughtered, and, uh, and people are willing to issue statements every day and say, uh, we regret the killing, we'll deal with the bandits. Those are, you know, those, those words don't mean anything. Those people need to be protected. Uh, in the first place, so that they don't lose their lives. Uh, these are people who can add to the um, wealth of this country and uh, you know the growth of the country, and uh, they are losing their lives needlessly. Every life matters in this country. And and then I have to ask you this: I mean, insurgency, Boko Haram insurgency, your ISWA problem is still there. But it appears banditry is becoming the major problem. What, what do you think is feeding this banditry we're having that way. We, we're just unable to have a complete gra grasp of it now. And let's be factual. Uh, we're beginning to see the banditry move away from the Northwest. We're seeing it now in the North Central. Niger State, for instance, is affected. We know that, seriously. We've seen some activities in Kogi State and Nasara State as well. So it, it's, it's not just the Northwest we're talking about here. It's, it's, it's beginning to spread to virtually every part of the North. We call that metastasis. You know, what is happening is, because it's not being dealt with competently, 
in the northwest where it was uh, regionalized around that Rugu forest. Now it's going abroad. Because, you know, these are bands. What is a bandit? Bandits are outlaws who group themselves together to commit crime, right? Mm. So, and they normally commit these crimes in ungoverned spaces. So, now, uh, after a while, because there's a constant stream of uh, bandits coming into this country from the whole of the Sahel, you know, they are coming into this country constantly. Uh, you heard the other day, Ganduji said, we should not let... Uh, a headsmen from other uh, uh, West African countries bring their heads in here. That is a daily occurrence, my brother. Even with all this so-called lockdown of uh, the borders, mm. uh, I'm forgetting what they call that operation mm. now, Operation Border Drill, the headsmen and their cattle and the arms are flowing in constantly from the Northwest. So it, it's a very bad situation. So the porous border, now you ask the question, to answer your question directly, you said, what is aiding it? Well, number one, we have porous borders, unchecked and unmanned borders. So it's an open alley. They just come right in. Number two, proliferation of uh, small arms and light weapons. We have 350 million small arms and light weapons floating around here in Nigeria. 500 million floating around in this. And where are Africa, these weapons coming from? Because it's one of the things that actually came up during uh, the, the meeting with the security chiefs. The, the president said something has to be done about this proliferation of small arms and light weapons. Where are they coming from? I, I agree with Mr. President. Well, to answer your question directly, you have arms merchants around this world, people who make fortunes, tons of money, on arms who are ready to proliferate. They fly planes. You remember I said outlaws operate in ungoverned spaces. They fly jets into those areas, uh, high-risk uh, ventures, fly in there and discharge their arms as long as they are getting paid. Now, let me tell you how it works. The kidnapper grabs somebody, collects 10 million naira from him, changes it to dollars or whatever, and pays for the arms, and the arms are flown in, and it's just like that. So, it's a, 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 in fact, uh, there was this uh, guy that was uh, kidnapped, and they tortured him terribly. And what did the guy say? He said that uh, the kidnapper said they wanted to kill him, but that because they needed the three million to pay for the weapons that they rented, that uh, they couldn't kill him until he got the money. So when eventually the guy got uh, 4.5 million, they let him go uh, because they had taken a liking to him. They let him go. They didn't kill him. But they were very emphatic that they were owing 3 million for the weapons they used in that operation. Mm -hmm. And they caught it. So what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is, is that, is that um, uh, kidnap cycle, uh, unchecked kidnap, poor intelligence, uh, poor... Uh, operational performance, that is what is feeding uh, this. Now, capability, let's go back to what we call capability and security. Uh, you have an army. There's an army marching in. That is army of bad guys, army of bandits, army of terrorists marching steadily. So they have people. They have people who are trained in warfare. And these people are from these battle hardened places, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, uh, Algeria, Libya. So, and they, they say, there's a brotherhood, uh, Niger, Chad. Chad. Chadians are the worst offenders. South Sudan, uh, not South Sudan, Sudan. Uh, we have many gangs that uh, are these uh, same bandit terrorist gangs in Kogi State that are led by Sudanese. Mm. I, I was involved in some uh, negotiations recently. So, you know, we have all kinds of people here who have created fiefdoms for themselves. And we should really be very concerned about this. And uh, we should really go after them with so much vigor that they will say, no, this place is not uh, conducive for us anymore. Now, the problem is they feel that Nigeria is big and rich. Nigerians don't care. Our law enforcement is lax. So that's why they're able to do these kinds of things. And uh, it's really very unfortunate. So I think the president is um, right in uh, reading the riot act to the service chiefs and uh, let them, you know, let them live up to their building. It's not about just the pets of office. There is job to be done in that office. And the job requires intellect, intellect, intellectual. Let them do their work. All right. Let's just hope the president follows through uh, this tough talk now with action because... 
it's not enough to talk tough, but we want to see action as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanaikomo, for joining us on the program and for your contributions, as always. Thank you very much, uh, Deji, for having me. God bless you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll switch focus. Stay with us. Don't go away. On Deji360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the Constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. The Constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete. The clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason why oh, this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that team. Uh, DG 360, providing clarity to issues.